have to do something. We're starving. There's nothing to hunt and it's just gonna keep getting colder. And not, I better put on a coat cold. We're talking dying feels like falling asleep cold. I'm Megan Hine, wilderness guide, survival expert and psychologist. I'm here today to discuss yellow jackets. You were going this way. I love what they're doing here, like improvisation in survival scenarios. It's all about improvising, adapting and overcoming uh, the situation that you're in. So what I'd be doing is taking the paper from these magazines and screwing it up. Because if you think about like your down jackets, all the little feathers in there, it's like their little arms locked together and it's the, the air spaces in between uh, the feathers that that's what the body heats up and keeps you warm. There's nothing to hunt. The animals might be migrating. That's probably why the only game we've seen for weeks was the one sick deer. But I'm going. You're gonna wanna take stuff with you, right? Like food and supplies? That's not up to you. One of our priorities of, of survival, just to keep us alive, is food. Winter's starting to come. The temperatures are starting to drop and you're gonna need even more energy. So if, in a survival scenario, as winter's approaching, you really want to have been gathering as much meat, fish, um, if you know what berries and plants and things are out there and you can ID them correctly, then gathering of those things. And they're now noticing that um, things like the deer and the animals that they've been relying on are quite scarce. And that is very scary to be in that situation. It is the most weird feeling suddenly not being at the top of the food chain and being on somebody else's um, menu for the night. I've been stalked by lions uh, and had encounters with bears. It's hard to kind of explain what that feels like unless you're in this situation. It's like every single cell in your body is screaming for survival uh, and it's trying to do everything it can. The panic, the anxiety, everything there. And it's incredibly difficult to keep it in check. <laughs> Fire is a really good method of keeping wildlife away. It's been throughout the sort of evolution of humanity. Our relationship with fire is really powerful. That's why if you ever sat next to your fire, you find yourself staring into it. It was like, we call it Bushman TV. It just like, it captures your imagination. It draws you in. But on a very fundamental level, it's a fantastic means for keeping wildlife away and at bay. Wildlife does not like big bangs and flashes and things. Flare guns are something that's often used in Arctic trips to scare away polar bears before you actually then escalate things. So it is a, it's a recognized method. So what she's done here is, is brilliant to try and scare them away. Hey, come on. You were going this way. The wind's blowing that way. The brush will be covered in snow. Less vegetation, less game. After months of being in this environment and the fact that she's in charge of the, the hunting as well, she's becoming much more in tune with the environment around her and that tends to happen. So things like wind direction is really important if you're hunting. You want to be downwind of animals that you're trying to hunt because if you're upwind of them, the wind is carrying your scent to them and they'll just disperse all over the place and you'll never catch them. Hang on. I'm gonna mark it. So what they're doing here is mapping the area. So if you're gonna be stuck in one area for a long, long time, and there's no help, hope of rescue in the immediate future, then actually knowing what the what resources are in the terrain around you is really important. So, you know, where's, where's the wood for your fires? Where are the animals? Where's the water courses? Are there any escape routes? Are there any high points where you can look out for rescue? Is there anywhere that you can maybe put, build signal fires that are ready to go should there be an aircraft coming over or if you're near the ocean, boats passing. Um, so knowing where everything is around you is fantastic. You're starting to build that picture up uh, for your long-term survival because they've now been out here for several months. So they're not just looking at short-term, they're looking at long-term survival. We should gather his blessings. Then how did Lottie get the birds? Um, Lottie didn't get the birds. They flew into the cabin. Because she told them to. It did happen when the blood dripped on the symbol that she made creators of this. Somebody's obviously done a huge amount of research <laughs> into how these things happen. And this is, like, this is such a fantastic showcase. I don't know what it meant, but I know I saw something. Something was out there with us. You had a near-death experience. Now you believe in what? Ghosts? 
tree demons, <laughs> wood sprites, come on. Don't do that. I get that you're scared too, but don't act like you have any clue what's happening out here because you don't. Thea is contagious. Not only have they crash landed, but they've had to deal with death, loss, being confronted with their own mortality and everything in their mind is screaming out for to try to help them survive but also try to make sense of this all this craziness and it's no wonder that like fear and anxiety start coming in and you start believing in things and start seeing evidence for those things as well around you and it's contagious once one person starts feeling fear we all start picking up on that and we all start reacting to that as well i had a dream last night there was red smoke and a river of blood. You've got somebody who's not taking their medication, who's starting to have visions and hallucinate. You've got a team of very vulnerable people. So in this situation, they're lost out in the wilderness. There's no hope or help at the moment coming their way. So they're latching on to these visions and they're starting to believe the visions that, this, that Lottie is having. Definitely shouldn't drink it. Oh shit, it smells weird. What did Lottie say was in her dream? A river of blood? So this is quite normal. This isn't unusual to see this. Leaves are falling down and they're breaking down into sort of the tannins and going into the watercourse and turning it red. Or from uh, mineral deposits like iron in the water um, as well can actually make water go red. Um, guys, the iron must be messing with the compass, right? I don't know, maybe? It'll probably work again when we get away from this water. Seriously, what? Should we, I don't know, maybe think about going back? We just need to get away from here. Wait, let's think about this. Think about what? I don't know, this stream? It is a pretty big coincidence that Lottie dreamed about it. And now the compass is acting weird. What did Lottie say when we found the plane? Some of them are actually stopping questioning the reality of this. And a lot of these girls may never have been into an environment like this before to understand that, you know, that blood doesn't normally run down rivers. But you can see both sides of this. You can see how there's a very scientific reason behind why that compass is spinning. But you can also see the fact that if you're starting to become susceptible to the fact that there's maybe a more spiritual reason behind things and that suggestion is starting to sort of infiltrate the mind you can see why you then start seeing this as some sort of sign or some sort of external being or spirit or something that's starting to mess with your head you have to be kidding me. i'm just saying what that what are you just saying the woods don't want us to leave do you know how insane that sounds the woods don't give a and all of this nonsense with Lottie's dreams and omens and whatever the that is. When you're in a situation where your basic human needs are not being met, you become very vulnerable, you become very suggestive to external factors, which is why for comfort, they start looking to voices of authority or people who are speaking in a way that is unquestionable, people who are giving answers to things that our brains are struggling to comprehend. Yeah, you see, that's what we call a coincidence, okay? Those birds were just, like, confused, or they, they had a disease or something. No, if they were diseased, then we would have gotten sick from eating them. What about the bear? I don't think anyone who saw that could call it a coincidence. Exactly. It all goes to show the only food we've had in months is thanks to Lottie. We are herd animals. We are uh, designed to live together as communities. And there's so many survival mechanisms and inbuilt mechanisms in our minds that are there to hold us together. Because for our ancestors, when our ancestors lived in situations very much like this, the key to their survival and you know why we've been so successful as a species is our ability to be able to work together. Um, so in those situations, it's like the, the mind is trying to hold on to other people, even if, what other people are suggesting is completely illogical. It's like you you need to be a part of a team. You need to be a part of this community. We're tuning into nature, into each other. That connection is what's gonna protect us and we need to nurture it, especially now. 
And this is why, this is another reason why people can be so suggestive or can be so manipulated into things like cults um, and sort of spiritual practices uh, and, and things um, and the occult and, and things can be drawn into, into stuff that they wouldn't be normally getting involved with if they were in a healthy environment. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, 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 fucked up doll? Is that normal, Lottie? Is that healthy? It's okay. It's not fucking okay! She was her best friend! Jackie's died, um, and two months on, her body is still there. This decision was not a good decision to keep, keep the body there. Um, they should have got rid of it in the moment. Uh, Sean is obviously going there and she's doing her makeup, she's communicating with her and it's a coping mechanism um, from losing her friend in this very traumatic experience. Um, and she's still acting and pretending and her brain is probably really believing that she's actually interacting with Jackie still. What worries me is the fact that if her body is able to be manipulated, if she is malleable so they can really move her arms, I'm wondering how frozen she actually is. Uh, and she will be potentially contaminating their food source, uh, particularly, it's awful, but particularly if they haven't removed the organs and the guts from that. Um, there will be a lot of bacteria growth in there, um, which will be contaminating all the food around that as well, and any water as well. We are getting rid of Jackie's body. We are getting rid of Jackie's two-month-old corpse. No! Yes! We, we can't even bury her. The ground is frozen solid. We can cremate her. What is great about this scenario is that rationality is still winning out. So that decision to get rid of the body has been made and nobody's overriding it, uh, which, you know, considering this cult, sort of mentality and mindset is growing uh, and festering there in amongst the team, that rationality at the moment is still taking precedence. So we've got um, Jackie's body here. They've tried cremating her. The snow's fallen overnight and hasn't completely got rid of the body. The body's still there. You can see them being drawn out. Goodness knows why they did it so close to the house. The smell from a burning body is horrendous <laughs> and that will now be permeating everything. But, and this is probably what's drawn them out, is the fact that that smell will now be turning to bacon. This scene is incredible. Whoever directed this and dreamed this up is, is, is amazing. So what we've got here from a psychological perspective is disassociation. When you're faced with an incredibly traumatic experience, the mind kind of separates itself out from logic and reasoning and goes somewhere else. And it's a very dreamlike state that you end up in. And it's a survival mechanism. And it's captured amazingly well on here is that dreamlike state of like back and forth between like the reality of what's happening and that dreamlike disassociation. What we forget as human beings is that underneath all that logic and reasoning and this incredible modern world that we've created lies an animal. That animalistic part of the brain is desperate for the food and it's now creating like a rationality that craving and need for food is overriding like the human part of us that wouldn't normally eat our neighbors or our friends <laughs> once that animal starts feeding it's like it is in control that is a starving animal right there and that's why it's like crazily trying to get in as much as possible okay so everyone just focus we know we can't touch those So I'd give the Yellow Jackets an eight out of 10 and potentially rising for their ability to be able to improvise, adapt and overcome in what is quite a horrendous survival scenario. It's fascinating to watch them. Thanks for watching. You can catch up on Yellow Jackets on Paramount Plus.